Praise you, Yah, for the rain. You know, September always reminds me, when I was a dove hunter, I was a younger guy, which could actually run and do stuff. We would always pray that it wouldn't rain in September because that's <laughs> September 1st was dove hunting day, right? And uh, started dove hunting. So it would, every time we would stake out our uh, little uh, pond and uh, it would rain and our pond would be worthless because the dove could eat, drink water anywhere. They could drink water on the side of the road and uh, in the field and stuff, but it was good if you were close to a field that was, uh, had been seeded with sunflowers because then they would at least come into that. But I know all the dove hunters today are going, not no more rain, please. We're going, more rain, more rain, hallelujah, more rain. So look, uh, this portion today is Vitzayim, you are standing. Almost always it's a combined uh, portion. It's always combined with Behelech, and he went. But this week, uh, due to how the, uh, uh, the Moets come into play, it's going to be a separate one. So we're just going to do Natsabim. Is that all right with you guys? What? Yeah. So it starts out Deuteronomy 29.10, and it goes through 30.20. And uh, so you are standing today in the presence of Yahweh, your Elohim. So I am standing in the presence of Him. All of you are standing today in the presence of Yehovah, your Elohim. You are standing here in order to enter into the covenant with the Yehovah, your Elohim. To confirm you this day as his people. What a blessing. Really. To be confirmed into the presence of Elohim. To be one of his people. Uh, so this. Uh, I'll tell you a story. It's a quick story. I don't know what the time is. I should probably have my clock up here. Because I want to give, I wanna give uh, Levi plenty of time to talk about the greatness of his trip. But uh, my computer broke uh, Wednesday when I was working on the finishing up this drosh, and I had to take it up to the Geek Squad. You all understand the Geek Squad? So they're like, uh, uh, when your power goes out and they tell you it's going to be Friday, right? And it always comes on Thursday, which is great. But they give you this little thing that makes you have hope that it's going to be ahead of time. And so the Geek Squad said, maybe Thursday, uh, but it's, I guarantee you'll be ready Friday. And so I went up there, and they, they led a message about 9 o'clock on Wednesday that it was ready. So I went up at 10 uh, Thursday and picked it up. And they said, I said, what was wrong with it? They said, well, it had a virus. It was duplicating your Microsoft 10 over and over. You had three versions on it. didn't know which one to use every time. So I worked through this. So this is, this is what I've come up with. Uh, so we know that this week in, in this Israel stands before you a while. They're about to enter a covenant. Well, uh, uh, a covenant is kind of like a solemn oath before Yahweh. And uh, this particular covenant promised that uh, Yehovah would establish Israel as his own people and that they would be their Yehovah. Now they'd said that before. I know you know that because when they were on Mount Moab, uh, Fire and brimstone was flying around. They're all scared. They, you know, don't even touch the mountain, all that stuff, you know. And uh, uh, the thing about it was that they said at that time, what you do, we will do and say, amen, which is what we say all the time. We say, well, yeah, Yahweh, whatever you say, we'll do. If you tell me to go to Africa, if you tell me to go to India, I'll go. And he did. Hallelujah. And so it includes everybody who's standing for Yahweh from the greatest to the least, to the heads of the tribes, the elders, officers, the men and women, the little ones, and the strangers from that day forward for all time. Now the greatest thing about this, uh, this actual covenant that he promises is that it's going to include everybody that's not there. And that would be you and me. We weren't there, right? But we're included in this covenant, which is you think, well, how, how is that, that that kind of thing can be? That he makes a covenant with everybody in the world at the time standing before him, and then he says the thing that should break our heart 
is that? He includes us. Today, standing today, I'm including this covenant. I'm making this covenant with its oath, not only with you who are standing here with us today in the presence of Jehovah, our Elohim, but also with those that are not here today. So that's Deuteronomy 29. It seems that uh, Moshe not only foresaw through the Roh Kadosh, that's the Holy Spirit, there's some Hebrew for you today. We've got, we are got to learn Hebrew. We're trying to learn a new language. And we know that Roh HaKadosh, it means Holy Spirit. And it means that future generations, but also that day when others would enter into the covenant with Jehovah of Israel. So this is a new covenant, right? So Jehovah, Jehovah also proclaimed through the prophet Jeremiah. So it, it's, there's the Hebrew Jeremiah, which I can't even say. Can anybody say the? Jeremiah. Say it again. Jeremiah. Jeremiah, that's right. That he would establish a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Uh, the Torah would be in our mind, written on our hearts, uh, which was a new, a new thought because uh, before that time, only the, only the Torah would be in scrolls. But now, you, now Yeshua, our Yahweh, same person, is saying it's going to also be written on your hearts. All would know him from the greatest to the least, and he would remember our sins no more. You know, that's, that's a beautiful thing. Think about that. From the greatest to the least, from the kings to the slaves. The one true Yahweh. And how did he establish that? How did he establish he was the one true God? Do you remember? He came to Egypt from the, hearing the cries of the slaves of Egypt that were the Israelis. He was crying, they were crying out to him, and he said, I'll show you, you've forgotten who I am, right? He said, I, you've forgotten me. You've forgotten who I am. You've forgotten the great God of Israel. I'm going to show you again. That's when he brought all the plagues on Egypt. And they came out of Egypt, across, dry, across the Red Sea, up through the, up through the dry bed, and sang the song that we sang this morning. Hallelujah. Uh oh, wrong way. So Paul, in a letter to the Ephesians, uh, which is we learn a little bit more Hebrew, uh, shelach is called a, it's in in Hebrew shelach is apostle. So Paul the apostle to the nations, and Paul was sent to the nations to proclaim Yeshua risen, and explains no Israel's were formally. Uh, explains that no non-Israels were formally excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of the promise without hope, without Yahweh in the world. The, the, the rabbis had been teaching all this time that if you weren't Israeli, if you weren't a Hebrew, you had no hope. You had no salvation. Paul said that's not what he said. Yahweh said everyone including the foreigner, if he proclaims my name, takes my name, you will be grafted in. Grafted in is a big deal. Now, y'all should have all clapped when I said grafted in. I'll give you a chance. Grafted in. Yay! All right. And so in Ephesians 2.12, he says, But now in Messiah Yeshua, those who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Messiah. So Messiah came back and he said, what are these rabbis are teaching you? When they sit in the Moses seat, when they sit and read Torah, do what they say. But when they stand up and start preaching, don't do what they say because they won't do it. They won't even do it. They'll make it so hard not one person can follow Torah. They make it so hard not one person can be grafted in. Not one person is allowed. In fact, they had a law that said you can't even go in their house. If you go in their house, you're sinful. You're unclean. If you go in a a Gentile's house, you're unclean. You can't go. You can't go to the synagogue next Shabbat. That's how corrupted the whole system was. Yeshua came back not for the lost, but for the house of Israel. Amen. That's hard to understand because we think he came back for us. But he came back to set the record straight. He came back to tell us this isn't right. 
Don't do this, right? All right. So those not Israel birth who have been brought into the covenant through the blood of Yeshua are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with Yeshua's people, also a member of His household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Messiah Jesus Himself as the chief cornerstone. Wow! We're lucky. Amen. I know you shouldn't say blessed. luck. Luck, blessed. That's right, Dad. Blessed. We're blessed to be brought into this covenant. The covenant people. So we're going to see Deuteronomy 39. That's part of the portion today. You yourselves know how we lived in Egypt and how we passed through the countries that on the way here. You saw among them their detestable images of and idols of wood and stone, of silver and gold. Make sure there is no man or woman, clan or tribe among you today whose heart turns away from Jehovah our Elohim to go and worship the gods of those nations. There's the, there's the warning, right? So we, can't claim, we cannot claim the privilege of the covenant at the same time, continue to walk in the stubbornness or stiff necks of our own hearts. So in Deuteronomy it says, living a lifestyle of sin as those do in the world. Living a lifestyle of sin as those that do in the world. We're set apart people. Amen. Set apart. Amen. We're not of this world. This world's not your home. I know that uh, Brian uh, Rushing makes fun of me because I didn't know what N-T-O-W meant. But I saw on the back of a car, the uh, back of a truck a few years ago. I said, what is N-O, N not of this world? I thought, there's, uh, there's that. Not of this world. The Brit Kadashah, do you know what Brit Kadashah means? It says it right there, it's New Testament. Somebody says to you when we're doing round table or something, well, let's go to the Brit Kadashah, and you're looking around going, what? Well, that's the means New Testament. So the New Testament confirms there's no sacrifice to cover a person who stubbornly, stubbornly persists in sin. So we talk about this from time to time in round table. And I uh, get it wrong a lot of times, but this, this will clear it up. Even while knowing the truth of Jehovah's Word, if we deliberately keep on sinning, because the reason we have Torah is to, is to show us sin. We knew no sin. Torah brings that, tells us what it is. If we deliberately keep on sinning, which is rejecting Torah, after we receive the knowledge of the truth, after receiving the knowledge of Torah, there's no sacrifice for sin is left. You know what that means, right? Because if you reject Torah after you know it, if you turn your back from Torah, if you turn your back from teaching, there's no sacrifice left. Amen. Until you do return, turn back, then you're back in. But as far as ever actually having a sacrifice, there's not one. I know that that's harsh words, and, and uh, I know that... Uh, uh, there were some folks a few, a few months ago that were looking at me when I said that. And I, I've got to be careful when we're in the round table because the round table is, is very, gets very deep, so the very, the very sowed level, the very sowed level of, of, the, of the portion that day. And if, you, if you're not careful, you go back so far or you go so deep into sowed that you say things that people misconstrue or even you miss, miss, miss say. You miss say a lot of things. You accidentally say things. Uh, that you think are true, which you've been studying, but then you come to find out, well, that's probably not really true. What I had said at that time was there was no sacrifice left. There was, what it was, was there actually is a sacrifice. You can always turn back. You can always teshuva. You can always come back to Yahweh. There's, 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 a, there's always an exit. But there's no, there's no actual physical thing you put on the altar now, right? Make sense, Dan? There's no actual slaying of an animal to prevent for that sin when you know what that sin is. You continue in that sin. When a, such a person hears the words of this oath, he invokes a blessing on himself and, and of course he thinks I'll be safe even though I uh, persist in going my own way. This will bring disaster on the water land as well as the dry. So when you break this oath, not only are you breaking it for yourself, you break it upon the land because the land is sacred. He's chosen this land for his own. Moses warns the Israelites that those who turn away from Jehovah 
and persist in following their own ways will spring to Jehovah's wrath. Have you ever had that? Have you ever turned? You say, God, if you just get me out of this, just get me out of this situation, God, if you'll just help me. This is a story about the guy that was swimming out in the sea. He swam out too far and he can't touch bottom. He's getting drug out. He goes, oh God, if you'll just get me back to dry land, if you just get my feet to touch the bottom of the sea so I can get out, I'll give you all my, I'll devote my life to you. And he keeps praying and praying. Suddenly he steps, steps on dry land. He goes, I got this, God. I got it now. I don't need you now. I'm fine. I'll get out. So he just walks out on dry land. Forgets all about all the crying and whining he did when he's out there. So Moses warns the Israelis that those who turn away from Yahweh and persist to follow their own ways experience Yahweh's wrath. He will not forgive them. Their names will be blotted out and curses written in the Torah will fall upon them. That's in Deuteronomy 29.20. 20. That's in our portion today. He also says, Yehovah will single them out from the tribes of Israel for disaster according to all the curses of the covenant written in this book of the law. What is the book of the law? Anybody know? Torah. It is Torah. Amen. So Moses warns in this uh, portion or this parashah <clears throat> that so great would be the destruction of the land because of the sin of falling after our own ways and the gods of the nations of those in land who would lay des desolate and barren, not unlike Sodom and Gomorrah. Not unlike Sodom and Gomorrah, because we know that Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, would you, would you, for, would you for 10? Would you save it for 10? Remember that? And Yahweh standing beside Abraham I said, yeah. Would you save it for one? Yes. For me. I'm the one. As he prophesies, this actually happened. <clears throat> Just as predicted, <coughs> the nations have asked, why has Yahweh done this to the land? Why this fierce burning anger? The bitter, horrible answer is always the same. It's because this people abandoned the covenant of Yehovah. The Yehovah of their fathers, the covenant he made with them when he brought them out of Egypt. So they saw all the great things that Yehovah had done. And still, they forgot him. They went after and worshipped other gods, bowed down to them, gods they didn't know, gods he had not given them. Therefore, Jehovah's anger burned against this land, so that he brought on it all the curses written in this book. In furious anger and in great wrath, Jehovah uprooted them from their land and thrust them into other land as it is now. So what happened? They were living in the land of milk and honey, and they were following his ways. And then came the dispersion. He said, you, you can't defile my land. This land is holy unto me. If you continue to do these things, right? If you continue to worship a God that wobbles and falls over, if you continue to worship a God you made with your own hand, you're defiling my land. The land I claim for me, for, my, for Yahweh. The land I claim for Yahweh, you're defiling it. You've got to get out. You've got to get out of this land. You're not allowed in here if you're going to act like that. Wow. Because of the Israel's sin, Jehovah and righteous anger uprooted the Israelites out of their land, scattered them throughout the earth, become wandering tribes in every nation. Well, there's some good news because it's that our Yahweh is merciful. He doesn't hold on to his anger forever. And he even promised through Moses that one day the children of Israel would return. Seventy years ago, this year, Israel returned. Foretold and promised. Hallelujah. Foretold and promised. That if he promised, his, he'll keep his promises. He keeps his promises. If he promises you salvation, what are the chances you're going to get it? 100%. Right? Pretty cool. So he says he would turn things around for Israel and bring them back to a promised land. So what happened? I'll be found for you, says Jehovah. I will turn again your captivity. And I will gather you from the nations and from all the places 
where you have, where I have driven you, says Jehovah, and I will bring you again to the place where I caused you to be carried away captive. Jeremiah. So May 14th, 1948. May 14th, 1948. What a wonderful day. So the, the borders of Israel were opened and all the nations came against them. All the nations surrounding Israel. And they attacked them. And with just a few tanks and a couple of Piper Cub airplanes, they defeated four nations. Four nations. And they said, the nations that were defeated said they saw behind the fighters in Israel, the, uh, uh, the group that was supporting it, the, uh, what's it called, what's the name of them? No, the, the fighters, the nations, the, the, uh, the people that fight. They're called uh, Diet or whatever. That Israeli Defense Force, IRF. They said looking behind them, they saw angels standing on the mountains. Not just one person saw this. All the people that were fighting against Israel saw this. And they, when they came to Jerusalem fighting in the streets, they said, we could see people behind you. We could see people behind you supporting you. We were scared. We ran away. So on that day, Jehovah made a personal uh, promise to them. May you have personally bring each and every one of us caught in captivity. It's a miracle. Do you know that? He brings each of us the same miracle that he gave to Israel. He gives to me and you. And when we are born again, so to speak, or brought back in, we're filled with joy and we can sing of the mercies of Yahweh, which we sang this morning. When Yahweh brings, personally brings each of us out of the captivity, it's a miracle. When Yahweh brought back the captivity of Zion, we were like those who dreamed. Those are, then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue was singing. Psalms 126. Brought back from captivity to Zion. You know, Zion is another word for Jerusalem. So when you see the word Zion, other than meaning it's the top, it's actually talking about Jerusalem. Jerusalem. That's pretty small. I thought I had bigger words then. All right. Uh, today, the nations no longer look at the desolate, barren land of Israel and think of the terrible wrath Yahweh poured upon the land and the peoples. That's what they thought. See, they said, where's your God? Look at your land. Where's your God? I know that we all talk about Mark Twain when he made a tour through Israel. He said, I've never seen a more desolate, barren space in my life. No one can live there. And in just a few years, Israel became productive in itself. It's self-dependent. You go there now, the fields are filled with flowers they send all over the world. The grapes and the vineyards are full, and they, and they pour out, they, they sell wine to the nations. They're not a, they're not a, a nation of debtors. They're lenders. Do you remember when America was a nation of lenders. Amen. Now we're indebted to the world because we don't understand that principle. Don't be, a, don't be a begging. Don't be a beggar. Be a lender. And it, says to, it also says, don't lend to your brother with interest because he is already in, he's already in trouble. He wouldn't be coming to you if he wasn't in trouble needing something. Give him his shirt. Give him your shirt. Give him your shoes. And don't demand it. If, if he pledges something to you in return for what you've given him, don't ask for it back. Don't keep it overnight. Give it back to him. If you have a cloak, give it back to him so that he's not feeling uh, indebted to you to the point where he's in, in, in trouble. Today it's said among the nation, you always done great things to them. You always done great things for us. We are glad. Yah, Yeshua, I mean, Yahweh's wonderful promise for Israel are coming to pass before us. He's restored the land of fullness. He's bringing his people back from the four corners of the earth. Every day, every day, Hebrews all over the world emigrate from the nations of the world back here. You know, Israel was living, while living in the diaspora, were never meant to find comfort and security there. They were never meant to be absorbed into that country. 
they always kind of felt like they were on edge a little bit. You know, they're, of course, they were persecuted beyond, beyond imagination. <coughs> you say, well, why is that? Well, it's kind of like a punishment uh, sort for Yahweh's people living outside the land. And, of course, the prophet Ezekiel said it brings shame to Yahweh's name. And he says in Ezekiel 36, 20, he says, But when they were scattered among the nations, they brought shame upon my holy name. Remember what I said about the land? They kicked them out. He kicked them out of the land because the land was holy, and they were following idols of other nations. He kicked them out. For they said, These are the people of Yahweh, but he couldn't keep them safe in his own land. Then I was concerned for my holy name, on which my people brought shame upon the nations. Do you get that? They had to keep his covenant to stay in his land. If you don't keep his covenant, you bring shame to his name. You bring shame to Yahweh. You think you're just doing it on yourself. You think, well, I'm just, you know, I'm addicted to whatever you're addicted to, and it's only brings shame to me, but it brings shame to his holy name because of people around you, the nations around you see that if you say you're a promise keeper, you're a person of the covenant, but you're acting this way. It's not just on you, you know. It's, it's on Yahweh. You're bringing shame to his name. Yahweh promised in this week's portions and through the Hebrew prophets to bring his people back to the land he promised them. Uh, the largest number, of course, are coming uh, to Israel from Europe after the Holocaust. Uh, that's where most of the dispersion was at that time. And they had become a very uh, strong presence in, in, uh, in, 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 <clears throat> in Europe. But they also came from North Africa and from the Arab countries. And they came from mass from Russia and Ethiopia. And now we see them <clears throat> coming back to uh, Israel from the United States. Uh, we, were, we were there one time having supper in, in a a father brought his uh, three daughters over to the, our table and said, I just want my daughters to see that there actually are people other, other than Hebrews that love our land. And their daughters have stood and talked to us for a long time. And I didn't get the, what he was really saying then because I was really new into Hebrew. And uh, he, was, he, was, he was from New York. He was a jeweler. Oy vey. How can that be, right? And uh, it was very, and it was amazing how much time he stood and talked, explained to his daughters, and their names were hope, joy, and love in Hebrew. Whatever those words are, his daughter's name were hope, hope joy, and love. And uh, uh, I can almost remember, I've really gotten bad in my Hebrew. But he told them, and they stood there, they were like 13, 16, 18, they were, they were old enough to understand what's going on standing at a table full of Americans on a, on a sightseeing tour, that he came over especially said that to us, that, uh, that you have brought this promise of bringing the nations back to Israel, back to Israel. So we see in Ezekiel 36, uh, 8, but you, mountains of Israel, will produce branches and fruit of my people of Israel, and they will soon come home, and I will cause many people to live on you. Yes, all of Israel. The towns will be inhabited and the ruins rebuilt, and that's exactly what's happened. All of his promises are good. All of his promises are true. If he tells you in Torah or the prophets or the writing or the Brit Kadashah, if he tells you something, it will come true. Amen. It's, it's, a, it's a, a unique thing to have something so true in a land and earth and time that we live in such false times. Uh, we hear all the things about fake news, this, that, and the other. You know, just tell me the truth. You have, we've actually quit watching news in our home because it, it, it's, just, it's just become so out of hand that you can't, you can't grasp it because it's not true. It's all lies. And then Deuteronomy, back to, back to the portion, I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I've set before you life and death. What do you choose? Blessings or cursings? What do you choose? Life and blessings. Amen? 
Amen? Do you? You do, don't you? Therefore, choose life so that you and your offspring may live loving Jehovah, your Elohim, obeying His voice and holding fast to Him. For He is your life and length of days. Holding fast is a really unique word. Uh, one of the highlights of this portion is, a, is the promise of life, blessing through remaining faithful to Jehovah, my God, my King. Our life is in Jehovah our Elohim. We have listened to His voice and hold fast to Him. He'll bless us and He'll bless all of our generations that come. The Hebrew word for holding fast comes from the root word glue. Do you know that? I didn't either. So it's Dabach. And we need to stick to Jehovah like Dabach. That's cool. Just like glue. You know, Isaiah, Isaiah, one of the great prophets, teachers of our, of our, of our uh, testament, says, oh, I did it again. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her righteousness shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. Today's Haftorah, Haftorah is a, a prophetic portion of Scripture. In the seventh and final Haftorot of conciliation, that's today, not today, we have one more to go, we have two more actually, which began with Teshibah, ends with Rosh Karashan. Israel declares that he will not keep silent until Zion receives a new name from Jehovah, and Jehovah makes Jerusalem a praise in the earth. You know, serving Jehovah requires the kind of faith that's based on what we believe and not what we see. You know, faith is this, I talk this, I speak of this sometimes because we were cast away because we believe in faith. <clears throat> we were with a congregation that believed on sight. And they couldn't understand us so much, you know, because <clears throat> when the uh, new moon comes, and I, and I have a friend in Midland that thinks this way too, because that's the way they did it in, in the old times. The scholars knew exactly the dead of new moon, the complete dead of new moon. That's when there's not a sliver. That, my friend, is faith. So we said, we believe in the faith of not seeing. We believe and haven't seen it. We believe the new moon's here, but we haven't seen it. We don't wait on the sliver. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's no one way or the other. It's just what I believe, what I think about that. Uh, so the, the, the faith is the substance of things hoped for and also the evidence of things not seen. So do you remember... Uh, He said, he appeared to them in the room. And he said, Thomas, put your, put your hand in my side. Put your hand in. And he said, oh, my God and my king. He goes, blessed are you for you believe. But blessed are those that have not seen, right? Blessed are those that have not seen and still believe in me. Greater is their faith. We'll get to that. I've jumped ahead a little bit. Serving Jehovah requires a kind of faith that's based on what belief and not what we see. The strongest faith that we can develop comes from personal belief in Jehovah. We're going to talk about this because once Moses is gone, who was the base of their faith, they have to find a personal relationship. Our faith comes from the heart, not of our eyes. Hebrew 1, 11, 1 says, faith is the substance of things so far, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is based on the unseen promise of Jehovah. Abraham's faith was based on the unseen promises of Jehovah. It was counted righteousness as him. For in Romans 4, we see Abraham believed Jehovah, and it was counted on to him for righteousness. Abraham's faith did not rely on what he saw, but because he had a strong personal relationship with Jehovah. And I say this, it's hard not to have a strong personal faith 
And you know, when he's saying, Abraham, right? He's saying, Abraham, hey, Mickey, Mickey, don't, you know? We guess it's like that. I don't know. I know that it's difficult today to find that kind of relationship. I know that many religions today, they seek a physical uh, presence or manifestation as a reminder that the Rokadosh, Holy Spirit, right? We're learning Hebrew as we go. Is present. The children of Israel also sought physical reminders that Yahweh was present. <clears throat> One of the physical representatives of Yahweh, the children of Israel, relied on Moshe. Moshe was the only person in the camp that spoke to Yahweh. And he was Pene Pene. There's some more Hebrew for you. Pene Pene, face to face. And we read in Shemot 3.11, Yehovah spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to a friend. And Yehovah says, Yeshua says to you, you are my friend. If you believe and do what I say, you are my friend. What a greater friend. Uh, can we have a greater friend than Yehovah? You're Yeshua. And because Moses spoke to Yehovah face to face, the children of Israel <coughs> relied on him to communicate Yehovah's will to the rest of the camp. And the children of Israel became dependent on him. And when Moses died, the children of Israel felt they'd lost their link to Yehovah. They'd lost their connection. He'd, he'd always been there for them, always telling them what Yehovah said to them. So after that, every person was required, required to rely on their own personal relationship with Yeshua, with Yehovah. They had, Yo they had Joshua, but Joshua was the keeper of Torah, but not the man Yehovah chose to bring the promise Israel had as he had with Moses. So Joshua was given the mantle. Do you remember that? The, the, that the very end of this, their, their very end of Deuteronomy, we talked about when, when Moses gives the mantle to Joshua. And all of Israel said, Amen. They said, Okay, we'll take that. We'll do that. But they didn't have the same connection they had with Moses. So we can see this in uh, Joshua. If it, if it seems evil unto you to serve your whole heart, choose this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which our fathers served when they were on this side of the flood, or the gods of Amorites, in those land we dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve Jehovah. Now that little plaque, every, every home probably has that plaque or something like that. As for me and my house, I will serve Jehovah. The rest of this was not on that plaque. These things you choose this day. Whom will you serve? Amen. Amen. Yehovah knew that each individual needed a strong personal relationship with him in order to have enough faith to continue serving him. In Bahalayek, we see that Yehovah even forewarned the children of Israel that after the death of Moses, their faith in him would crumble and they would again turn back to serving their idols. They, uh, even, even in the purity of Jehovah on the mountain, they chose to build an idol. And we always laugh and, and snicker at this, you know, uh, Moses comes down and says, where'd this calf come from? And Aaron says, it popped out of the fire. It was crazy. I didn't do it. But they were serving, uh, they were serving in, in just a short time uh, uh, other, other, uh, other gods that they did not know. The Barim, Deuteronomy 31, 16 through 17. And Jehovah said unto Moses, Behold, thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, and this people will rise up and go whoring after the gods of the strangers of the land. Whither they go to be among them and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. And we agreed. They agreed. They made a covenant with him. And he said, not only after you, the, 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 just shortly after you pass away, they're going to go whoring after other gods. Whether they go to be among them will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them, then my anger shall be kindled against them in that day. And I will forsake them, and I will hide my face from them, and they shall be devoured. And many evils, troubles shall befall them, so they will say in that day, 
Are not these evils upon us because our Yehovah is not among us? No. Yehovah is still there. He hasn't left. He hasn't changed. He's not way over there. He's not under this, over that. He's in your heart. He hasn't left. You've left. You left, Israel. The children of Israel had not developed the type of faith that allows individuals to believe without seeing. We believe without seeing. What's the manifestation of this? What's the manifestation of not seeing? We receive healing. We receive rain. We receive uh, a touch from God. We, we have all these things. We know they're from Yeshua, but we have these things without seeing. In Genesis 15, Abraham said, Behold, to me thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. And behold, the word of Yahweh came unto him, saying, This shall not be your heir, but he, but he that shall come forth out of your own bowels shall be your heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward the heaven, and tell the stars. And if you're able to number them and sit unto them, so shall be your seed. That's faith without seed. He believed Jehovah and he counted to him for the righteous. Abraham's faith was counted as righteousness because he believed even though he did not seem physically possible. Abraham's faith in Yeshua, whoops, in Yahweh surpassed what he saw. Believing without seeing allowed Abraham to establish a strong personal relationship with Jehovah. And therefore Yehovah, Abraham's faith strengthened his relationship with Jehovah and led him unto righteousness. Faith without seeing. So he was told something that he couldn't see. So great was this thing, it was unimaginable. See the stars? Can you count them? There's your seed. See the sand? Can you count it? There's your seed. Physical reminders can be used to strengthen our faith. However, when we replace godly worship with physical reminders, it becomes idolatry. And I want to, you know, we, 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 we have this problem with the cross a little bit. Uh, I know <clears throat> when I was young, talking to my friends, when I first kind of figured this out or, or been shown that this uh, faith required belief without seeing to the point where anything that gets in my way of seeing that is a is form of idolatry. And I had over the years accumulated hundreds of crosses. And I had them on a wall. And they were just stacked up there, you know, just, just and it was so beautiful. And I wasn't worshiping those crosses. I, uh, I mentioned this one day to my golfer buddies. And I said, I took down my cross wall. And uh, <clears throat> they said, why? And I said, well, I just, just thought it just seemed odd that I worship a God that can't be seen, but I've got these crosses on the wall, lots of them. And I had spent, you know, money buying these in the effort to nail them up there, you know. I'm nailing, <laughs> wobbling little idols knocked on the wall. So I took them down. I never said another word about it just that day that I just mentioned it. And a few years later, a friend of mine that was led worship at, at, uh, at uh, uh, I guess I said this before, he led worship at uh, Golf Course Road, which is a big church of Christ in Midland. And uh, he, I, he said, hey, the other day I was sitting there drinking coffee at my house and I looked up at those crosses on my wall and I said, that ain't right. Took them all down. Wow. Wow. Here's the song leader of the huge congregation acknowledging the one true God. And I said, Kevin, that's pretty great. Praise Yah that you've got this. And uh, <clears throat> he still isn't to the point where he understands the Sabbath. That doesn't stop me from talking about it. 
and not being with them on the Sabbath and understanding when they need the fourth to fill a foursome, right? I'm not going to be there. Uh, and, but there was a time and, and when, when Dan was uh, holding the door at the, uh, at the uh, Mission Dorado Church, which is where we work, he was holding the door there, and uh, I, at just about 1230, if that lady that was always standing up asking for prayer was going through her little deal, I'd come scooting by him. I'd say, I'll see you. And I'd go right out to my car, get my car, get my golf cart, drive it out there and start playing golf. This went on for months. Every day convicted, every Shabbat convicted of that. You know, still doing it. And uh, this was a, this is just like what we're talking about today. I was being a poor example for the Sabbath. I kind of Sabbath did, I was a Sabbath a little bit, baby Sabbath tie, but then uh, I wasn't doing it right. And so I got it. And it was tough. It's tough to give up something like that. It, it's, it's against your nature. Uh, when we rely on physical proof, they can easily be deceived, right? During the end times of prophet, the Antichrist will use physical signs deceive many, he even calls fire down from heaven. And we read this in Revelation 13, states he did, not, he did great wonders so that he made fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceived them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles he had the power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by sword and did live. So we know Hasatan can't do anything originally on his own. Anything he does is a kind of a what? What's the word? He kind of does a, a, a false image or a replica or a, a, a counterfeit. Thank you. He's, he does a counterfeit thing. He counterfeits what Yahweh does because Yahweh is great, does great things. And so the only way he can do that is to do something that's been done before. The false prophet calls down fire from him because it's a duplication of Elijah's miracles. 1 Kings 18.13 and 2 Kings 1.10, physical signs can be deceiving. We should develop faith that leads to a personal relationship. Only by making a strong personal relationship with Yahweh can our faith endure so that we walk in righteousness and in spite of what we see. First Kings 18.39. Then the fire of Yahweh fell and consumed the sending offering and the wood and the stones and the dust. It licked up the water and was in the trench. And all the people saw and fell on their faces and said, Yehovah, he is the Elohim. Yehovah, he is the Elohim. What do we know about a second, somebody second something? If he says it twice, we should pay attention to it. Yoha, they see in it. These are the, the 50 prophets of Baal are standing around and Yehova sends fire down as soon as, soon as uh, Elijah asks and consumes it. And so I said, second king, the same thing. Answered to the captain of the 50, he said, if I am a man of Elohim, let fire come down from the heavens, consume you and your 50 men. The fire came down from him and consumed him and his 50. The exact same thing that the false prophet does coming up, the same thing that the false prophet's going to do has already been done. He duplicates it here. He, he will deceive you with things you know. Don't be deceived. That's, that's the, the thing with, with making idols and having idols. You, you become deceived. You think that's the thing doing good for you. You think well, if I make enough money, if, if, I'm, if I work out, if I'm strong, if I'm handsome, if I'm beautiful, uh, people will love me. I, and, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I will say great things for God. I'll be, I'll be the, the, the preacher, the teacher, the singer, the, the guy that says the prayers and all these things. You know, if I, I'll, I'll be, I'll be uh, faithful in that respect. And he will look upon me and say, you great and faithful servant. What if he says, where were you on Shabbat? Go away. I never saw you on Shabbat. I don't know you. Right? Have you heard that saying before? We all heard, we know what he says. 
He goes, they come to the door and knock, let us in, let us in. He opens, I never saw you. Who are you? I never saw you on Shabbat. I never saw you on New Moon. I never saw you on the Moedims. It's, it's a great, great thing to be included into that class of uh, Shabbat worshipers. Matthew 24, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many, and because torrentless will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. In this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world and as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. And then the end will come, as in the day of Noah. Acts 23, Acts 2, 39, For the promise is for you and for your children and for all those who are far off. Everyone who El Yehovah or Elohim calls to himself. The exact same promise is given to us in Acts. That's given us in this portion this week. Isn't that the greatest thing? Can you say hallelujah? hallelujah. Isn't that great? The same exact promise given to us. Hallelujah. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you for watching a teaching from Amet HaTorah. If you are ever in the Odessa area, we would love to welcome you to our Shabbat service, 11 a.m. every Sabbath. For more information or for more teachings, feel free to find us on the web www.amethatoraodessa.com Also, you can find us on Facebook. Thank you. God bless you and your family. Shalom.